Good evening. It's great to see you all here. <laughs> and I'm reminded by some of the veterans that coming to an event for Purple Line in which pitchforks are not carried and the participants can be assured of support by the majority of the audience is a wonderful sensation. I'm sure you'll remember. Purple Line now has been around since 2002 uh, through the foresight uh, uh, particularly of the Sanders family, who remain engaged, uh, who had the good sense to see that the abandoned freight line between Bethesda and Silver Spring might be a good possibility for a light rail line. And that was expanded later, of course, by uh, MTA to the scope that we are seeing built now. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to uh, welcome you here. Many of you have heard of the Purple Line Carter Coalition. This is an invention of Garrett Knapp from the Center for Smart Growth in the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, of which I'm emeritus faculty, you may know. Um, Garrett saw the annoyance and disturbance caused by the prospect of the Purple Line, uh, particularly among the Latino community uh, in Langley Park and CASA of Maryland and decided it would be appropriate to invent an organization which included all people who felt as they did, that there were threats to social stability, economic viability, that might be caused by the development uh, in the phenomenon, of course, more widely known as gentrification. Garrett invented the Purple Line Co Co Carter Coalition and has spent the last year uh, successfully obtaining a Tiger Grant from the Federal <laughs> Transit Administration of the Department of Transportation. We had a meeting today at which we have devised a meeting to be held in March to which all of you who have supported this project are invited. The purpose of the organization is to coalesce the benefits uh, and the uh, positive change that will be brought by the Purple Line along its route. And in the progress, he has made the project into a single never mind by county enterprise. And it's terrific to do that because if we see the two counties as a single community, we see the benefits that are being brought to members of that community, both as they move east to come to places like College Park and as they move west as they go to jobs from Langley Park in the western part of the region. So. Uh, that coalition is underway, as I say, and the first organizational meeting uh, to which all of you, uh, I trust, will be invited. If not, and you have interest in doing so, please just contact us and we'll make sure you hear about it. Uh, it's terrific that this is happening because Garrett supported it on his own funds for a year and a half, and now it's real and supported by this grant, which he's received. I also want to take note of the death of Keith Holler in December. Keith, as you know, is, is known as a pollster, but more than that, he was a political intelligence. He was a person who understood the legislative workings of our two counties and the state in a way that no one else did. Uh, he was full of ideas and advice to us. He was the first person, and really the only, to emphasize the strategic importance of the Purple Line to the United States government and security because of the federal agencies that the line will connect. And we're grateful to him for that insight and for many, many others. Uh, he began not showing up toward the fall last year. We were unaware of his illness until we learned of his untimely death. So many of you, I'm sure, knew him, and I want you to understand how valuable he was to Purple Line now with his insights and his activities uh, with us. So without uh, any further comment, again, thank you all for coming. And I want to welcome the mayor, who has been good enough to have this facility for us this evening, Patrick Wojohn, a member of our board. Thank you. It's great to be here this evening. It's great to see so many people here this, this evening. Uh, I, f I feel like um, I, I'm a relative newcomer to the whole Purple Line movement, but then again, compared to how long the movement's been in place, I think a lot of us here are relative uh, newcomers. Uh, but I've been mayor for about three years in, in College Park. Before that was a city council member representing the northern part of the city. Uh, and and, and I, I 
knew some knew a few things about the purple line was excited about having it come in knew about the difference that it could really make um, but now as, as mayor i have the opportunity to to help help lead the city at a time when when we face some of the critical challenges and and uh, and opportunities uh, that come with the, the construction of the purple line and uh, it's those challenges and opportunities that i'm gonna that i'm gonna talk about tonight uh, uh, the uh, because we're, we're we right now are working as a community to, to harness what the purple line will will bring to to us and uh, and uh, uh, I'm I'm very excited about what's what's going to be happening here about the opportunities it does present uh, I'm I'm concerned about some of the things that we're going to have to deal with in the next uh, a few years in particular during the construction and and how we're going to handle. Uh, the, the challenges that that, that construction uh, presents. Once I know that once the purple line comes, it's going to be a, a huge benefit to to, uh, to the College Park in so many different ways. Uh, but in the meantime, we we have we are going to have to deal with some some uh, some heartache and, and some uh, not some some belly aches and some some headaches and and uh, all sorts of problems over the next uh, couple of years. So um, let me talk about those and let me start by, by talking about the the opportunities because those, those uh, it's always it's always nice to, to start with the, the good stuff and and really and keep that vision in our heads as we as we deal with the challenges of the next uh, few years. Um, uh, because ultimately, we we know that the purple line is going to make a, a huge difference, and and that will keep us going through all the uh, times that we have to sit in traffic, uh, uh, waiting um, uh, while, while the purple line construction is going on. Uh, and and I'm going to talk about three three of the key opportunities that I see for College Park, and then talk about three three of the the challenges and and um, uh, obstacles and, and uh, issues that we'll, we have to confront as well. Um, so first. Um, uh, as uh, Fred, Fred, Fred mentioned, we have uh, the issue of development, and, and uh, we've already started to see really the, the new development and the opportunity that, that is going to come uh, to College Park as a result of the Purple Line. Uh, many of you may know about the, the, the um, may have seen the, and uh, some of you have probably been at the, uh, the, the new hotel that we have in College Park, uh, the hotel at the University of Maryland. Uh, that hotel, uh, is has been really transformative in terms of the the uh, first of all it's a, the the first really high end uh, hotel in the Baltimore Avenue corridor in College Park. Uh, it was something that was desperately needed uh, because of uh, that the university is desperately needed because of the uh, the space it provides for conferences for academic conferences and for events. Uh, it's been uh, a, a location for uh, many uh, different important events in our county, including our um, um, recently uh, uh, de departed county executives uh, last uh, State of the Economy speech, uh, the, count the, the new county council's uh, recent uh, retreat, uh, that has all happened at that hotel. And that hotel would not have been built there had it not been for the Purple Line. Uh, the, key, the key there was that the, the, um, uh, David Hillman uh, from Southern Management, who, who, uh, who wanted to see this, this hotel and bring this hotel to College Park, one of the reasons why he brought it to that location was because uh, it would be right along the Purple Line alignment. And that's just the start of what we have to come in, the, in, in future years. Uh, we have, uh, a, there is a development coming uh, um, that Gil Bain is bringing at the College Park Metro Station, uh, in part because of the, the, the advantage it offers of, of being not just in the future the, the site of, of uh, one major transit line, um, but, but soon uh, to have two. Uh, we have uh, the entire Discovery District, which is uh, a center for, for innovation uh, in College Park that is uh, making College Park really the, the um, I, I like to say this, the Silicon Valley of the DC Metro. Um, there was a little, there's a little thing that's opening up in, in Northern Virginia that you might have heard of recently that <laughs> might, might, might create a, a challenge for us in claiming that title. Uh, but I, um, uh, I, I know that we are, and we have, we're already seeing uh, significant new uh, businesses, growing businesses uh, uh, from the tech se sector come to College Park, open up, bring us new jobs. And, and they're, they're coming here in part uh, because we, we're a, a vibrant community and a great place to be, but, but also because uh, it will be, they will be along the, the purple line and be easily accessible, uh, more easily accessible uh, by their employees because of that. Uh, so um, 
uh, the other one, the second big opportunity that I want to have, uh, hone in on is is the the possibility that uh, the Purple Line offers in terms of helping us deal with our uh, with with our our transportation situation um, more broadly, and uh, so. According to the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, the region is going to see an additional 1.5 million people within the next 20 years. Uh, we uh, are going to see, a, we have seen an increasing density in College Park and we are going to continue to see an increasing density in College Park, uh, in part just because there's more people moving to the, the region. And in order to deal with that challenge, that, that those, those new 1.5 million people in our region uh, could come all all in cars and, and could mess up our our our, uh, our roads even more than they already are messed up, uh, or we can we can think strategically and think about the best way to 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 bring them to our region in a way that that makes sense that takes advantage of existing infrastructure, uh, and and uh, and and gives people the opportunity to travel. First of all, um, to not necessarily travel as far to live close to where they work. Um, but when they do have to travel, do so uh, in, in, by means other than a single occupancy vehicle. Uh, and the Purple Line offers that opportunity. Uh, with, the, the, uh, with the development that we've seen in College Park, we have more and more people um, who are able to live closer to the university with the Purple Line coming in. They'll be able to, to live close, any, close to the entire corridor of the Purple Line and travel much more easily to College Park. Um, and finally, uh, we are developing a cohesive identity as a city in College Park, and uh, and four of the f four of the 21 uh, stations of the Purple Line are, are in our city. Uh, a fifth one is right outside of, of College Park in Riverdale Park, um, but those five stations are all going to be part of a, as I'm sure uh, the university will talk about, uh, of a of a, a free uh, corridor for uh, for University of Maryland students. So they'll be able to travel between those. Uh, for free, and and th those will help tie our our city together in another in another way and in, in a unique way. Uh, right now, Route One is often seen as sort of a of, of a of a barrier in a city that it's difficult to traverse, difficult to get across. Uh, the the Purple Line will help bring us bring us together from east to west. Let me just talk a little bit about the challenges, and I know I'm I'm I think I'm I don't know if that that bell that rang for me was was meant that I'm out of time or or uh, I can keep going. We've got a few more minutes. Okay. Um, some of our, our challenges. Um, uh, I mentioned disruption during construction, and um, you all may, may or may not know that in addition to the Purple Line construction happening over the next few years, uh, the State Highway Administration is engaged in a, a major project uh, along the Baltimore Avenue corridor in College Park between Regents Drive, the south entrance to the University of Maryland, uh, and Maryland 193 and Greenbelt Road. Um, that project, like the Purple Line, will be will cause us some problems while it's under construction, uh, but ultimately will significantly uh, will be a significant benefit to our community. Will significantly improve transportation in College Park by making Baltimore Avenue more walkable and bikeable. But in the me meantime, we have these these headaches, and um, um, we understand. Uh, we're, what we're trying to do is look at these look at these two projects uh, together and figure out what we can do to minimize the amount of disruption that takes place in our community. Uh, we one concrete example of that is that uh, for several months um, uh, next year in um, College Park, the during the Purple Line construction, uh, Campus Drive is going to have to be uh, shut down uh, between uh, basically underneath. Uh, where Campus Drive goes underneath the uh, the, the metro tracks, uh, and uh, we've been talking actively with uh, uh, the Purple Line team, uh, trying to figure out a way to minimize the amount of disruption that that's going to cause. Um, our focus has been on, on keeping that disruption uh, uh, for uh, focused on in the summer months when the students are not here, when traffic is at a minimum. Um, but also keeping it instead of instead of uh, instead of keep we have a, a choice essentially of of having that disruption go longer and be de less disruptive while it's happening, or or shortening the duration and having it be more disruptive by shutting down the entire um, uh, roadway. And our, our option was in order to try to keep it during the southern mo the summer months uh, to uh, limit the duration, but but uh, but but allow work with the 
the purple line to allow them to, uh, to, to shut down the entire road. Uh, and then is it going to be disruptive? And we've been dealing with the questions like how the, um, how the bus lines are going to come to the College Park Metro Station. Um, for, for some time, they're going to have to do that through a residential neighborhood uh, with a heavy volume of buses. Um, but we're working on ways to, to, to minimize the possible disruption by, by um, uh, working on, on some noise issues and some ways to make the buses move more smoothly so that they cause minimal disruption for the neighborhood. Um, one thing that uh, I, I'm very concerned about is, as mayor and has, is a challenge in our region already, uh, but as we see the Purple Line uh, come into College Park, uh, something that we're going to have to deal with even more is, is housing affordability and uh, affordability of real estate for our businesses, making sure that we, um, that our businesses are able to stay open and functioning during the time of the construction and, and beyond uh, as, uh, as the Purple Line uh, causes an increase in property values. Um, so uh, we are part of the Purple Line um, uh, Corridor Compact. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to working with the county more in terms of affordable housing and, and working on supporting our businesses in any way that we can. Um, we recognize that that will present some challenges. Uh, and um, to me, the Purple Line is, is all about helping us, uh, helping us forge a greater community here in College Park. And uh, one thing that we're going to have to be diligent about in the years to come is making sure that, that we work with our, our residents and our neighborhoods uh, to, to maintain that co cohesiveness. Uh, change off, off, always brings disruption to a community. And as we, uh, as we see this change come, uh, I'm looking forward to working with our neighborhoods to make sure that the, that the disruption that we face is minimal <coughs> and that we really work to bring and, and harness the benefits that the, that the Purple Line has to offer. Uh, so thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Through the magic of the internet, we are able to read tomorrow's paper today. And uh, uh, Fred Craig, the CEO of the Purple Line Transit Partners, uh, will discuss some issues that may have come to your attention as the result of an article written by one of our favorite journalists, Katie Shaver, which has already appeared uh, in the press. I assured Fred that he was among friends, that in fact we're all here because we want this project to happen, and I hope that you'll agree that he is a person of grace and humor and will be completely honest about what he's going to tell you as he has been so far with us. Please join me in welcoming Fred Craig. My mother's 95 years old, and she told me when I took this job, I better keep my sense of humor. <laughs> so today was a big day. Um, you all probably read the newspaper, and I want to address that directly, first thing, right out of the chute, because that's probably what most of you are concerned about. These projects um, of a magnitude that this is have a vision for people that they go through the planning process, and then they think about the end when the project is running and everything is done and people forget about how hard it is to get from the vision to the reality. And, you know, it was, it was back in March, I think your last meeting, I'd been here about three weeks. I'd gone to a Littonsville meeting, and we were going to close their bridges. The community was hostile. I'm thinking, oh my God, what have I gotten into? And it was been, it's been interesting because like the welcome I got and the people here in the room, um, you all have been very warm to me as an outsider coming into the project, and I want to thank you all for that. Because when you make your living setting up orange barrels, disrupting people's you know, nighttime sleep over by the tunnel, uh, doing things that just are really tough on them, cutting down trees, all that kind of stuff. And I take those things kind of personally because I know this is a little bit like a blindfolded person describing an elephant. It depends on where the elephant touches you and how the elephant touches you. And the purple line is a 900-pound elephant under construction in this community. But that also gives us some tremendous opportunities. And, you know, people look at me as sort of the leader of this project. But I've got Alfred Isaacs over here in the corner who is our equal employment opportunity person. We have a big employment program in this area for training. James Doherty is my CFO. He came from running a big business unit for a major construction company. Ashley Bagwell is here. Gary Witherspoon from MTA are here. So we have a very, very strong team 
doing this project to try to deal with some of the issues that came out of the newspaper. And Katie's article was, was accurate, okay? Those are all things that are going on uh, within our group. And, you know, when you start a project and it sits for a year in a delay in a lawsuit and you have closed and you've got everybody and all the momentum ready to go and all of a sudden you go to a dead stop and you think people sit, there's equipment, you can't do the job. And you, then when you get the lawsuit settled, you win. It's not like you ramp up to $50 million worth of work a month. It takes time to go back. And so when I got here in February, I think the lawsuit was four or five months old from being settled. And the whole idea was how do you regain that momentum? And a lot of it comes from people like you. Your enthusiasm, the level of political support here and the enthusiasm for the project has been a comfort to me because I'm accustomed to projects where they burn me in eff effigy, literally. And so to come here and feel welcomed has been very helpful because this project is transformational and I feel like that is probably the thing that keeps me going every day. By the time something gets on my desk, it's a problem. And it's usually not a good problem. So what I try to do is think every day, what is when we're done here, what's this community gonna be left with? And it's a little like planting a tree. You never plant a tree for this generation. You plant it for those who come after you. I will not be the beneficiary. I will be dust in a box somewhere by the time this project really shows all of its benefits. But there are many people in this community who are going to rely on it to get from a place where they would like to work or like to live to a place where they want to live or work. It is going to be transformational, and I am shocked to see, frankly, how much development is going on in this community as an inducement to, or as part of the Purple Line. These projects always are double-edged sword. The development opportunities that are coming with this for housing and everything else, the hotels, also mean that older infrastructure is going to get replaced, things may get torn down, but that's the reality of what happens. And if we don't invest in our communities, we don't have a vibrant community. It's always amazing to me to drive into Washington, D.C. and see the number of tower cranes here. For many people, that's a disruption. To me, that's a barometer of the economic health of the community. And one of the reasons that Amazon chose this area was because of this region. And it's the investment that you all have supported for decades that have made that happen. So that, to me, is what I picture I want to paint for you because today was a difficult day. I won't, I won't lie to you about that. But what happens on these projects when you start them and you stop them is that there are costs associated with this. The lawsuit really set the project back. But that's passed. And what we're trying to do now is not have that delay two years or not cost a huge amount of money, but to be realistic about what that is. And then try to figure out a way between my group of people, the owner, and the contractor to make up for the time and the money. Because that's what's going on right now. And so if you ask me questions about that, I'm going to probably turn them over to Gary and my CFO to answer because they got the magic wands. But my goal will be today is to try to give you an idea of walking through the project because that's what I do every morning. I get up at 6 o'clock and I drive from one end to the other. And I drive it through rush hour so I can see how bad the traffic is. And I go to the community meetings and listen to the people because to me that's the most important thing I can do to try to minimize the impact and try to bring the project in on as close to on time and on budget as I can. So that said, we're going to walk through the project a little bit because to me, you don't want to hear me beat my gums. What you want to do is see what's going on because you don't see everything that's going on from Bethesda to New Carrollton, and there's a lot going on. There are hundreds of people out there working right now, and they were working this morning at 6 a.m. when it was 20 degrees and the wind was blowing down in Lindensville Bridge. So I'm going to take you through that. The real estate development here that's going on along this line is really pretty incredible. Everywhere you go, you see housing or real estate or other things going on that are alongside this, and this will raise the property values, no question, in the community. Hopefully, everyone will benefit with that. And those that may not benefit, I believe that government and industry will look to try to help them with some of the impacts associated with that. But this, job, this project is the only one like it in the country that goes around in a ring and connects two major lines. So you can go to Bethesda, you can be on the Bethesda station and get to Boston in a one seat ride. One change, you'll be able to go from Bethesda to Boston. That is unique in this country. And that I think is one of the things that I wanted you all who've been here for the vision, really believe what the change of this is going to be. We have, it's amazing to me how much economic development is going on here. It's really incredible. Go to the next slide, please. 
when you look at what's going on in the county around the purple line, it provides tremendous economic opportunity. And I sat through a presentation that Montgomery County did about the economic development opportunities coming with this. It's, it's, it's incredible. And the investment that comes with that raises property taxes. It provides an opportunity for people to work. It's an inducement for people who want to come live here. And this is a beautiful place to live. I've lived all over the country, and I've lived in Western Europe. This is a beautiful place, and you should be very proud of it. We want to protect it and make sure we try to do as many things as we can to make it better. This provides a tremendous number of job options. I'm going to put these slides on our website because some of the economic development stuff on this is something you ought to really take a good look at. I can't do it here. There's not enough time. But it is going to transform the economic development opportunities for the community. Next slide. So we are having the vehicles. The first of the vehicles are being built uh, in uh, Elmira, New York. The prototype vehicle we're going to go see next week. You're going to begin to see those things arrive sometime in the next 12 to 16 months. Um, they are a unique vehicle. This is very similar to the vehicle we used in Cincinnati for the Cincinnati streetcar, except it's twice as long, and it's a 1,500-volt uh, system. Very efficient, fewer stations, and a very nicely developed and built car. It's beautiful. And it really is the icon of where people are going to ride this vehicle. It will be beautiful. Go ahead. So the part of getting from here's the vision to riding the trains is an awful lot of noise, dust, <coughs> barrels, construction, problems, all kinds of things. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that. Uh, the first slide here is this is the big hole at the west end of the job at Bethesda. We are going down 150 feet to tie into WMATA's station there. It's in rock. It's got an office being built around it. It's right in the middle of Bethesda, and there's no room to do anything. I mean, we have to bring stuff in that day to be able to put it in the shaft. So that's what you're seeing under there. Those big yellow things are big braces to keep the dirt from collapsing because this thing is 150 feet deep, and the shaft is about twice the size of this room. So it's a big hole in the ground, and it's got rock in the bottom. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, so this is where you guys get to be the Mythbusters. You get to yell, fire in the hole. Okay, we're going to practice this. One, two, three. Fire in the hole. Okay, so this is what happens. So that is at the bottom of the shaft in Bethesda because we have rock in it. And one of those things about that is we are right in the middle of a community. It's noisy, it's dusty, and it creates vibrations. We have a tunnel, we have a hole. And in the tunnel, we're doing 24 hours a day because that's what we need to do to keep the work going. But we were right under a community, and we had to slow that down to try to minimize the noise and vibration for the community. The contractor worked very hard to do so, and still is ahead of schedule on the tunnel. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Next slide. The Lintonsville Bridge. I'd been here two days, and I went to the public meeting in Lintonsville, and I got chewed up. And I determined that we were not going to do that again. And so we set up a program to get this bridge open and operating and to make the detours as minimally invasive as possible. And we were about three weeks longer in meeting the six-month construction schedule, despite having had the wettest uh, year in history here. So yes, we were three weeks late. Yes, we get assessed liquidated damages. Yes, we are going to do better. Because this is the first of about 10 bridges we have to build on this project, and they're very difficult to do. But this bridge opened last Wednesday, this past Wednesday at the work of an awful lot of people. As I said, I was out there this morning at 6 a.m. It's 20 degrees, and these guys are out working already. And I went by to thank them for their work and their effort because they're the guys who get the work. Next one. The Glen Ridge Yard is over here on Veterans Parkway. That looks like a beehive, okay? It looks like a bunch of guys when you drive by. It looks like an anthill, and there's all these people digging and working. That is where the maintenance and storage facility goes. And the reason that that's important is that's where the vehicles go, and that's where we're going to start testing them in about 18 months. So that is on the critical path of getting the work done because that test line goes right down Veterans Parkway and goes, comes across on East West Highway. So a very important part of the work. And you, you notice there, it's wet. We have, had a, we have had a very wet year. and We've been very careful not to pollute this site with mud, debris, and everything else. It's a very important part of the job. And we have two hours. If we have mud on the street, we've got two hours to clean it up. And it, this place, is, we're trying to keep it looking like the inside of your living room 
Believe me, there's a tremendous effort about that. Okay, this is the tunnel on the bottom and the Manchester Palatial Station at the other. This is being hand mined. And these guys work in pretty difficult conditions. It's hot, it's noisy, and it's very dangerous work. Tunneling is one of the most dangerous pieces of work, but these guys are ahead of schedule and they're doing a great job. And they're working 24 seven. And God bless the people who live over it because they have taken the brunt of the work on this job in terms of noise. Next slide, please. So again, these big pipes are the bracing. And so we have to, for, for people who are in the construction industry, there are a couple of big things to do. One is topping out a building. The other is breaking through it at a tunnel end. And so this tunnel has big rock bolts in it. We dig the dirt out. We spray it with concrete. We keep going till we get to the other end. And we're digging half of the top because that's how you support it. Then you go back to the other end and you dig the bottom. Well, for, for tunnel rats, the big thing is the breakthrough. And so what I wanted to do is try to show you a little bit about what's involved in doing that. Because this is the end of the tunnel after about three months worth of mining by these guys. And they've taken out, taken out tens of thousands of yards of material. That's the end of it. So here's what I want to do. Um, this is a serious day. And I don't want to make light of anything that happened today or the difficulty or disruption of this project. But I also want you to think about the fact that this project has some really incredible things going on in it. The people working on it are from all over the world. And we have some very, very good people here trying to make sure that we get on time and on budget with this project. So what I wanted to try to do was we put a video together the day that we opened up the end of the tunnel. So I'm going to take all that applause for the guys that did the work because that is a very difficult thing to do. And I thought I'd share with you the one great thing about this project is there's some great toys on it. And the first day I walked into the tunnel and I saw the gear that was in there doing the mining and everything, I'm like, can I get up on that? Yeah. Because I've always been that, you know, my talking toys, and now I get to watch and pay for big stuff. And so I just want you to think about the men and women that are out there on that job. Some of them are tonight working to do this tunnel, to do other things, to desperately get this back on time. Because our goal is to bring this project in on time and have an RSA date that is equivalent or less than the delay caused by the lawsuit. It's going to cost some money to do that, and that's what we're working on. And some of that is in negotiation right now, so I'm really probably not going to answer that. Katie's article today had all the benefit of all the information that's out there and was accurate, okay? It's a tough situation that we're working on, but we have some of the best people in the world working on it, and we will deliver this. Whatever happens, this project is going to be built and you will be riding on it in a few years. And so I just want you to keep that in <laughs> mind when you read about all the things that are going on here. Okay, it happens on every project. But I want to thank you for your commitment. Many of you have been very warm to me and I can't thank you enough for that because when you come into a project new, new to a community, and you're really not sure what's going to happen and people are friendly to you, when you're setting out barrels, making noise, making blasts and everything else, it's very nice to be welcome. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Fred. We, we remember the governor at the groundbreaking when he was given the opportunity <laughs> the to the demolish the shed. It was terrific. Prince George's County has been a consistent supporter of this project from the beginning. It worried us a little. We figured, well, look, we haven't heard from anybody yet. There must be somebody out there, but it's never happened. Political support, popular support for this project has been understood in the county from the beginning. We're very appreciative that Brad Frome has risen to an advisor to the new county exec and is going to talk to us about his role and the county's expectations from the project. Brad Frome. Thank you. I'm the exception to the illustriousness of this panel. Um, let me just say one quick thing, because it was mentioned earlier, and I think it's worth repeating, is um, to pay respect and, and gratitude for those who have had a role in making this project uh, happen for all these years, far before I worked in county government. I say Eric Olson's back there. I know Eric's been a, a leader in that effort for many years in the county council, and before that in the um, College Park City Council, and I think he speaks for all those folks who held elected position and also worked and a lot of the agencies in government who helped make this happen. And, um, you know, without them, we wouldn't be here. And I know you, you mentioned it, but I did, like I said, I wanted to repeat that. So um, I worked under the, the prior administration under Rashern Baker. 
uh, oversaw the Department of um, Public Works and Transportation, which obviously played a key role and plays a key role in the Purple Line, had a role in negotiating our agreement with the state, so on and so forth. And um, County Executive also Brooks asked me to stay on, which I gladly did, and uh, she moved me into a new role where I don't oversee uh, the Department of Public Works and Transportation. So right when all the bad stuff starts happening, I exit stage left, and uh, Floyd Holt, who's out here, he gets to do that uh, going forward when all the complaints start rolling in about the impacts. Um, in addition to, to, to mentioning Floyd, I also wanted to, um, Vic Weisberg was, uh, was mentioned as a member of the board. Vic is our, our Purple Line coordinator. Uh, he's the person in Prince George's County government who every day um, manages all elements uh, Purple Line. In addition to being a, a good friend of mine, he's a, a, a heck of a public servant. And um, I wanted to recognize him because, um, you know, he's the person who I always check in with uh, when I hear, when I read the Post article this morning, when anything else happens about the Purple Line, I say, Vic, what's really going on? What's the, what's the skinny here? He's the one who has those answers. And, um, and everybody who lives in Prince George's County benefits from his service. Um, you know, my boss supported, my prior boss uh, supported the Purple Line uh, throughout um, his administration because, you know, we see the benefit of transit. We see the benefit of transit from an economic development perspective. Uh, we see the benefit of transit from a long-term transportation perspective. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, call me negative, but I think the, the, the day and age of $2, uh, $2 a gallon gasoline um, is not going to be for much longer, uh, not to mention the impacts on the environment. Uh, not to mention the fact that the, the, the folks who produce most of the oil in the world, aside from the United States and Canada, aren't necessarily the best actors either. And I think is the I think transit reflects the long-term transformation of where transportation is going. And uh, we're, we benefit from having such a key element of that in this county. Uh, not only the Purple Line itself, but also connecting to the rest of the Metro Line um, and weaving in with our transit system. Uh, that's important for the long-term stability of the county, and it reflects the, the future trend line of where this country, I think, hopefully, and in fact, will be. Um, it also means for us regional connectivity. Um, we have, we benefit, we have the, the greatest economic development engine in the state of Maryland and the University of Maryland in our county. And as mentioned earlier, the Purple Line weaves that through and connects not only other parts of the county to that, but also connects University of Maryland to Montgomery County and other economic centers over in Montgomery County. And, and, and with that, I also want to recognize Carla Colella, who's back on the wall, um, who I know the University of Maryland has done a lot of great work in the Purple Line. They're going to be suffering from a lot of the impacts that construction is going to entail. And let's not forget, too, uh, Dr. Wallace Lowe. It wasn't that long ago where the University of Maryland, and I'm just going to call a, a spade a spade, was an impediment to the Purple Line. Um, under, in my opinion and many others, a false pretense of electromagnetic impacts uh, was held bet against the Purple Line. And it wasn't until we had the leadership of Dr. Wallace Lowe, who understood what the Purple Line really meant and understood that short-term pain for long-term gain is, is a worthwhile investment that this, can, this project is really happening. And, um, and he's one of those other people who, if not for him, we probably wouldn't be here. Um, but, but Carlo is his man on the ground, um, a, fa a fantastic engineer in his own right, and someone else who we work closely with um, as we bring this project to, to fruition. And lastly, what the Purple Line means is, is, to me, accessible transportation is a human right. Not everybody can afford a car. Not everybody has that luxury. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to participate in educational opportunities, in occupational opportunities, in going from one place to another with their children. And that's what transit means, let's, let's be honest. And, and having that is something that as a government and as a society we have an obligation to provide. It's not the only thing, of course, uh, healthcare, education, among others, but transportation is right up there. And the Purple Line helps provide that opportunity for so many of our residents, so many of our residents who are working class and of lower income. And that's important for our county. And it's important enough that if the Purple Line construction had started under Governor O'Malley, we would be out $0. Uh, now we're going to be out $120 million. 
Um, it mattered enough to us, and it mattered enough to my prior boss, and then members of the county council, that we're contributing $20 million a year over six years to the construction of the Purple Line. That's, that is a, a per annual basis, that is more money than we spend in our state's attorney's office. That is a princely sum for this county, but we're contributing it to it because we believe in it. And not only are we making that monetary contribution, but we also, as, as Mayor Wohan noted, um, we agreed to additional impacts during construction. We agreed to the closure of, the, of Campus Drive. We agreed to flexibility in the construction standards that originally led to the proposal for a 120-yard wall um, at the intersection of Kenilworth Avenue and 410. We actually ended up coming out of pocket to remedy that situation and have a development that was worthy of that neighborhood. But those were many of the contributions that we have made along the way to make this project happen because we know how important it is to this county. Um, so what are we doing during construction? Well, obviously, we're going to have some impacts. Uh, we're going to have impacts on traffic. We're going to have impacts on our neighborhoods. Uh, we're going to have impacts on our existing businesses. Um, and those are real. We've worked closely with the state, with MTA. They're the lead on this in communication. We think more can be done, uh, to be perfectly honest. That's something we've communicated publicly, privately, through telegram, through telegraph, every which way possible. We can't wait for citizens to sign up for systems to get alerts. We have to be proactive in telling them how to sign up because we all benefit when they know what's going to be happening and where so that they can plan accordingly. And I think we need to do more with communications um, because not only is it going to mean for a, an easier time during construction, but let's face it, you mentioned earlier, sometimes you go in front of a room with a bunch of angry folks. We don't want folks angry with this project. We want folks just to see the good side, and we want to minimize those negative impacts. Businesses are going to be impacted as well. We have a, there's a lady in my office who uh, opened a restaurant when the D.C. trolley trail uh, was being constructed, and, and her restaurant went under, and it went under in large measure due to the impacts of that construction. I was going to say still a worthy project, maybe, maybe not, um, but those impacts to businesses are real. And I'd ask that everybody in this room and everybody who supports this project be mindful of that and maybe go out of their way to support those businesses who are going to be impacted during construction because they're going to bear a lot of that, uh, a lot of the, a lot of that negative impact. Let's be, let's be frank. It's going to be centralized where construction is going to take place. But let's be honest. This is a good problem to have, right? Uh, there's a lot of places in the state of Maryland, our friends up in Baltimore, not to mention the rest of the United States, who would give almost anything for the construction impacts of a light rail network. Um, that's why we fought this fight. Uh, that's why we're here. Um, so we are going to be negatively impacted during construction, but let's celebrate that for what it means. It means we're going to have a light rail network in our backyard. Um, we also, I want to be clear too, as construction takes place, our, our role as a county during the construction of this project is fairly limited in the sense that we do not improve, we do not approve the individual elements of construction. We review them, we give some feedback, but this is, this is approved under the auspices of the state. But there are certain things that, that we care deeply about. Um, the original design under, uh, that was approved under the prior governor had a lot more bells and whistles. And I, I understand why Governor Hogan dialed some of those back. He wanted to make it an affordable project. But let's also not, let's also make sure that we're not looking at something that would have been built in 1950s East Germany either, right? And I'm not saying it is, don't, but don't get me wrong. But we want to make sure that we invest in landscaping. We want to make sure we invest in public art. Uh, we want to make sure we invest in bike lanes next to the construction of the Purple Line. These are things that seem minor in the grand scheme of things, and maybe they are. But when we drive past this beautiful piece of infrastructure, we want to see it well landscaped. Uh, we want to see good public art at these stations because that's going to really reflect this project. And we've had very good discussions with the state. state's been good about that. MTA has been good about that as well. But that's something that, that we might, at the end of the day, even come out of pocket to enhance the landscaping around the Purple Line just for that very reason. So the other thing we're doing now is we're planning ahead. Um, we want to make sure we can take advantage of the opportunities that are going to be created by the Purple Line and mitigate some of the risks. I, for one, I'm not going to, I think that, I think we need to be clear. I think there are 
There is the prospect of gentrification, but let's also be honest with ourselves. We've got 15 metro stations in Prince George's County, and not many of them are suffering the ill effects of gentrification just yet. In fact, we spend a lot of our time in our government working to attract transit rate development in the county. And I think that while we have to be mindful about affordable housing, let's keep it in perspective. What we often have too often in Prince George's County is we have low income housing, high income housing, and it tends to be sequestered in different areas. We want to blend. That's what we want. We want to blend. We want higher income housing where there's often affordable housing. We want affordable housing preserved. We want affordable housing expanded, especially when those options don't currently exist. And we absolutely want them by these stations. Back as I was talking about before about the human right element of transit. Um, so what are we doing? What are we looking to do when the purple line is built? How are we going to look to take advantage of this? We're going to look to make sure we have a trained workforce uh, to take advantage of some of these opportunities. Now, now the opportunity is directly related to the, to the operation of the system itself. We're not talking thousands, but we're talking hundreds. And we're talking a good way for people to make an income to support their family. And we want to make sure that our residents are trained and able to take advantage of those opportunities. And that's something that we're doing right now with our workforce services office. We obviously want to make sure we take advantage of the economic development opportunities, obviously. Uh, you know, we look back, we all know the story, we look back during the last recession, the places in Washington, D.C. who had the smallest decrease in property value, you can put pretty much on a map, the metro rail stations. We get that because that's where people want to be. That's where people want to be. And we want to create an environment where people can be there. Right now, we, many of you probably know, we, are, we just redid, and um, Councilmember Glaros, who just stepped out, she was the leader of this effort. And she did a fabulous job on this. Uh, we, we, we redid our zoning ordinance. Our zoning ordinance was a vestige of the 1970s. And we updated it to reflect a priority around transit. Um, and it's going to take place. It's going to be in effect um, a couple years before the Purple Line opens. Well, a couple years, three years, well, we're not quite sure. Um, and it's good timing because that's going to be a tool that's going to allow us to take advantage of these economic development opportunities around these stations. We want to make sure we align our incentives with transit, too. We do a little bit of that now. Under the Alsterbrooks administration, we're going to be doing a lot more. Looking at how our school <laughs> surcharges are computated, looking at how transit impacts, how transit adequacy is determined by transit. These are all things because at the end of the day, it is cheaper for a developer to build out in the ground field in the hinterlands. We get that, but it's more expensive for our county to bear the cost of that development. So we want to focus that development where it makes the most sense for our county, which is by the transit stations, not only our metro rail stations, but obviously our purple line sites, and regulatory assistance. And I don't mean regulatory assistance as the White House would say, where we're just going to allow more carcinogenic substances coming out of smokestacks, but I mean actually having a hands-on role in making sure that we don't, look, developing by, this is something that I did under the Baker administration, Developing by transit stations, metro rail then, is more difficult. You've got existing infrastructure, it tends to be tighter. You've got the operation of the system to be mindful of. It's tougher. It requires a more hands-on approach. Um, and you need to have that hands-on approach because if you're going to invite people in to develop by these stations, you want to be there to help them get over that hump so they don't get delayed because time is money. And that's something that Carlo, Eric, we spent a lot of time on. Um, is making sure that we're there as a government to play a role. And I'm not saying, you know, you waive the rules. You just make sure that everybody is communicating. We had an issue right now, uh, Mayor Wilhan mentioned the uh, Gilbane project over at College Park. Well, there's a big WSSC line that goes through that site. These guys are building the Purple Line. They want to build a mixed-use project there. And we got a 60-inch water main we got to move. So, you know, if left to their own devices, and WMATA, left to their own devices, you're you're at a stalemate, right? It's going to take a while. So we as an office have played a role in trying to work through those processes, trying to make sure that everybody's needs get taken into account, but that it gets well coordinated and can move in an expeditious fashion. And you've got to play that role if you're going to make transitory development happen. Um, we also want to make sure our transit network is roped into the Purple Line. We're going to work hard. I'm not going to make any promises, but it's one of the priorities of, of my boss to expand our options for bus service in this county. County bus service now ends at about 7 o'clock at night, doesn't go on the weekends. We want to try to change that. 
It's a costly endeavor. I'm not going to sit here and say it's going to be done, but it's something we're going to look into. And we want to make sure that obviously takes advantage of the of these purple line sites and weaves them in to our transit system. Uh, lastly, you know, the other things we're going to make sure we do is, is placemaking and investment. Investment in the placemaking, let me go back to placemaking. The reason why the prior administration under Rashawn Baker, we made that investment to go back in the design of the station at Riverdale Park over at 410 and Kellenworth Avenue is because we want that to be a special place. We want that to be a special place. We found a 120-yard wall unacceptable. We want that to be a focal point of that community, a focal point of the commercial development around there, a focal point of the neighborhoods who exist around that site, something that they can be proud of. And we spent money out of our pocket to make that happen because we want each of these stations to be important. We want each of these stations to play a central role in the neighborhoods around them. And lastly, we want them to serve as magnets for investment. My boss ran for office on redirecting investment in this county inside the Bellway into our existing communities. And what better way to help be an accelerant along that process than have this, what's the final cost, four, six, seven billion dollars? It's, I know, it's, it's, I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the most difficult things I ever did, well, I'm, not, I'm a simpleton, was negotiating the MOU at the state on the purple line and you look at the cost and the availability payment structure, man, it is tough stuff. But it's a pricey project, no doubt. And we want to make sure that, that we take advantage of that investment because that investment is happening in the parts of the county where we want to see things happen in our existing neighborhoods inside the Beltway. That is going to be the focal point of this administration and this project helps get us along the track, no pun intended. Not even a good one. Um, <laughs> That's all I have. I'm here to answer any questions after the render of the speakers. Um, there's another institution on the other side of Baltimore Avenue, up behind the University of Maryland. It's higher education and it's University College. <coughs> I'm delighted to have George Trujillo with us. He's facilities manager for University College. I assume you understand what a huge operation University College is. Uh, they are in 20 countries around the world. When I was in Germany, there was a wonderful little campus in Heidelberg, and classes were held even on my post. It's a fantastic institution, which is frequently taken for granted at, by the university. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome George. And he, of course, has a stop on the Purple Line. Thank you very much for having me out this evening. Um, I don't have anything like the responsibilities they all have. And I'm really here tonight to talk about a very small part of the Purple Line and how it affects the University of Maryland University College. So as, he met, as um, it was mentioned, uh, University of Maryland was uh, founded over 70 years ago, and our main headquarters is located adjacent to the uh, Delphi Road West Campus Station. Uh, we are the largest, America's largest online public university with over 86,000 enrollments worldwide. And as he mentioned, we're in 20 different, uh, 20 different countries throughout Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. So our main executive, our main office, uh, executive offices and administration building are along with the College Park Marriott Hotel and Conference, um, <coughs> and Conference Center, which we own and Marriott manages for us, are right adjacent to the station. So needless to say, we're really excited about this. Um, last year, we had over 200,000 guests come to the site for either conference or to, to, to uh, come into the, to the buildings. And um, this is going to provide us with additional, um, additional mode of public transportation that's going to provide a lot of access to our employees, our guests, our students. A lot of, we use, a lot of people don't know this, or, but we use a lot of the classrooms over on College Park for night, evening classes. So it's going to provide a lot of extra flex, flexibility for students to be able to attend classes at the university and come to our site. Uh, additionally, we're very committed to sustainability as we're a member of the President's Climate Commitment, which is asking us to reduce our carbon footprint. And this is going to help us tremendously to help reach our goals at, to reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, we have been an active participant in the planning of the Purple Line and the Delphi Road Station for the last several years and attending workshops and meetings to provide input to the plan and I mean we've been very well received and we've really enjoyed our, our relationship. 
Um, as mentioned, you know, it, it does have a huge impact. And for us, it's, we, we feel it's a huge impact for us because every single one of our utilities runs out into the campus drive and every single electrical sewer, data lines, everything is getting moved across the street. So we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna feel the pain while the project's going, but we've had a great relationship with the Purple Line people, meeting with them, working with them, and coming up with plans on how to reduce and mitigate as much of that disruption that we're going to have to our site. Um, as we were going through the planning process, one of the things that we, we realized we needed to do was the station is like on the back side of our building, right adjacent to the back side of our two buildings. And we, we realized that, hey, to really get a, you know, the bang for the buck, we need to develop the site around the station to be cohesive with the station itself. So we are currently working with Flora Teeter and an artist recite to develop a plan that as you come off the station and arrive at the station, it brings you in as a new entrance into our university. We're going to have some, we're visioning some rolling um, sidewalks and some fixed lights and artwork that's on a station that's tied back into our site. So we're trying to create a very cohesive uh, site plan there so that we can be tied into it and make it a new entrance into, the, into our site. Um, so, th and, and, and we're going to be paying for that. We're not even asking to do that. We want to have this thing happen for us, and we, want to, we think it's extremely important. As you, come off, if you come off of campus, as you come up campus drive off the University of Maryland, and as you come in, up in the train into the station, you notice we have loading docks, so we're trying to create natural buffers to enhance appearance and, and make it really a uh, placemaking station for us. Um, so the, these are things, so, and create a very cohesive space. Uh, we, we feel that this is going to add a new dimension that we currently don't have, and it's going to encourage our guests and students, workers and stuff, to come to work on the, on the Purple Line, which is not there today. Uh, our site is kind of secluded. I mean, if you, if you look at it, there's a couple of bus stations. We're out there on the corner of University and Delphi and Campus Drive. So this is really going to open up the can or, or site to a lot of, it'll make, it'll make it much easier to get into the site. So I don't have as much to say as everyone else did tonight, but as I mentioned earlier, we're extremely excited about the Purple Line coming through. We understand it's going to hurt. It will hurt, but we'll get through it. And uh, we're, we have a great relationship with the Purple Line team as we've been working through these things. And like I said, we can't wait till it's open and operational. Thank you. I retired from the University of Maryland 10 years ago. And after I sat on the bench for the requisite year and a half, I invented with my colleagues a course called Sustainability at the University of Maryland. And several of the lecturers in my course are here. And David Allen, the Director of Transportation Services at the University, was always uh, a speaker to my course. Last year, he averred in favor of Anna McLaughlin, who he has hired as an assistant director. She is the manager of transportation demand and comes from the District of Columbia and is a wonderful presenter of a program called Smart Commute. And for College Park, this should be of extreme interest because this parallels the positive opportunities uh, presented by the Purple Line with the opportunities to discourage automobile traffic on the campus. And I experienced that personally today when I parked mistakenly in a garage and discovered at, by internet, by email, that my car had been ticketed because my emeritus parking hangar had been concealed and was therefore caused me to be subject to a $75 fine. So this is, this is a two-edged sword. But to indicate Anna's sense of humor, those of us in the university community have received an invitation to what's called a pool party. And this is a party she has devised. Turns out it's not in a swimming pool. It'll involve the game of pool, at which interested people can come and find ride share partners in order to leave even more cars off the campus, free of the risks I took today. So please join me in welcoming Anna McLaughlin.
thanks, Ralph. You really set me up there for success with this. <laughs> Better be good. Um, this has been a really informative evening for me because I have not been um, integral in the in the planning and the development of the Purple Line through <coughs> campus. Um, so I've learned a lot. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and I have to defer to Carlo. I don't know if he's still here and his team at FM that has really been managing that project for campus and keeping the rest of us on campus um, informed and educated about what is happening and what those impacts are going to be. Um, so like Ralph said, I, um, my, I work for transportation. I do sustainability. I do transportation demand management, which is just a, an acronym, a fancy way of saying I try to provide information and programs and incentives to get people to choose not to drive their car alone, right? So, um, so that's what I do. And I am going to get to reap the rewards of the Purple Line through campus because it's going to provide so many, um, it's going to provide, let so many more people get to campus without their car. Um, I do just kind of want to talk TDM, when we're looking at TDM and sustainable transportation at the university, we're looking at it through a lens of the Climate Action Plan. Um, we have committed as a, as a campus to become carbon neutral by the year 2050. And our carbon footprint is part of our commute trips back and forth to campus, employees, faculty, staff, students that are commuting to and from campus as part of our carbon footprint. And, and we are gonna get rid of that, right? So we have to be <coughs> making steps um, to make it easier for people to get to campus without their car. Um, the other lens that we look at TDM through, is in, especially in the transportation department, is parking loss, right? Always parking is a very hot button issue and always fun to talk about parking. Um, so we as a campus, we're growing, right? We're, we're having these amazing new um, academic buildings, new residence halls and dining halls, and it's amazing for campus that we're having these new facilities the natural place to build them is on parking lots, right? So we build them on parking lots and then we don't, then we have to manage the parking and how do we, how do we figure out how to make campus work when everyone is used to driving and we don't have the same resources to park them. In the past three years, 2015 to 2018, we have lost about 3,000 parking spaces on campus. Um, and that kind of is a real incentive for us as a Department of Transportation to figure out how to devote, where to devote our resources, right? Do we build another garage? Sorry. Um, do we build a garage? $30 million, $40 million. Um, so do we invest in this garage and build a parking structure? Or do we try to make it easier for people? Do we have better shuttle routes? Do we have incentives? Um, do we invest in programs that I manage? And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about our Smart Commute program. Um, because we do a whole host of things for campus um, employees and students to allow them to make these, these choices that aren't driving alone. Um, things from discounted permits for carpools. Um, we have incentives for people to bike to campus. Um, so bike, a bike commuter incentive program that provides um, covered secure parking and shower access and discounted bike gear. Um, a whole, we have transit benefits for those that take transit, so they can have deductions made and get make have savings on their transit costs. Um, zip cars on campus. We participate in the Guaranteed Ride Home program. TDM is really about providing options and as many as possible. There is no one size fits all. There's no magic bullet that's going to work for everybody. And people need options in general, but on a day to day basis. You know, some days. I transit most days, but some days I do need to drive and I need to be able to figure out how I can manage those different options on different days. Um, in the fall of 2017, we launched our Smart Commute program, really trying to put all of these programs and options under one umbrella, launch it to the campus community, um, and increase participation, awareness and participation of these different programs. We launched it with a platform. We have an online platform that we use where people can go to a website, they can register, they can find all of their transportation options to get to campus in one place. They don't have to go to WMATA's website to figure out what the WMATA buses are, and to PG County's bus website. It's all in one. It has your bus routes, your transit, bike routes, um, and you can find a carpool partner. So if you have someone that lives down the street from you that also comes to campus and is here Monday through Friday, and they're interested in riding with someone, this will match them up, help them form carpools and vanpools. 
So that's kind of what we do with SmartQ, and we're trying to, we continually are trying to add new incentives, new programs. Um, we have transit screens that we have just installed in the last couple of months on campus in our student union um, to let people see what, again, what their options are. When is the next bus? If the next bus isn't coming for 20 minutes, I'd rather stay here and have a cup of coffee than go wait out in the cold in the bus. Again, trying to make these options for people easier. Um, what we also are kind of in the midst of a parking pilot, a parking cash out pilot program where we're piloted with 50 employees on campus that had their parking permits last year. They agreed to give them up for $425. So at the end of the year, we're gonna give them $425. So much cheaper than building a parking garage, right? Um, so we're trying to like figure out what are the programs and what are the incentives that really resonate um, with our campus community. The parking cash out has been super successful so far and we anticipate rolling out even further to more employees, to students even. Um, so that's kind of smart commute. And then the purple line is just going to, you know, I said there's no magic bullet. The purple line is gonna have a huge impact on how people get to campus. It's going to make my job a lot easier. It's gonna provide these um, options for people all along the line. Um, in addition to all the other benefits that it's going to bring to campus, and I know we've talked a lot tonight about the benefits and challenges, and I think we're all aware of them. Um, I'm kind of excited that I get to sit back and kind of reap the rewards and give people another, another way to get to campus without their car. I think that's it. I'll take any questions if you guys have any. Uh, Fred, some questions on <laughs> construction. Uh, what is the likelihood of additional significant delays? Specific. What are potential causes of delay how, of the project, I assume, not the trains? How are these risky risks being assessed? Okay. Uh, when I was not here when this current team was awarded the job, I was on another team that did not win the job. So I was part of the bid process, an unsuccessful bid process. But there was, the way that the project was put together was that there were um, a set of preliminary engineering plans. There were assumptions about uh, rights of way and there were assumptions about utilities based on a preliminary engineering package. And then our job was to uh, take those to estimate the cost of relocating the utilities, doing all of the track work and the relocation of all the other things that had to happen, and then bid and operate this project for 30 years after we built it which is, as you can imagine, a tremendously risky thing. It's like having a, a crystal ball. So what happens in these projects is everyone builds in some contingency for risk. The owner does, uh, the contractor does, I'm part of the concessionaire, we do. And so what happens is, is you try to quantify it the best you can, provide a contingency for things that are out there, and then when something comes up that's unanticipated is try to work through it. And as you can imagine, these projects have many, many unknowns. This is the, one of the largest utility relocation jobs in the country outside of our hurricane recovery. Because everything that's going here is all the old utilities, just drive down East West Highway in Riverdale. Everything here that's 1930s utilities is all being replaced. And some of that was unknown when it was started. And so the risk about this is trying to quantify, manage it, and then determine who and how it's going to, how it's going to pay for. And that's really the, the challenge we've got that we're working through right now. Um, certainly nobody wants to try to, uh, to shove this on, on any other person. This is a collaborative effort going on between MTA, the concessionaire, and the design build team. Does that adequately answer that? I think so. We were talking about this initially. Uh, before the evening began. It's not just the single lawsuit from Chevy Chase that caused that delay. There have been hesitations at numerous moments during this process of getting this thing going. And so for the resilience you all have had to show, first in finding that there was a commitment to it on the part of the state, because remember that we all participated in raising the gas tax in Maryland to make a revenue stream in part for this project. There have been other hesitations as well. Okay. I need so um, there are a couple. Let me do one or two more on construction, Fred. For construction documents, can they be posted on the uh, partnership website? I believe, they're, I believe they're posted on MTA's website. 
but if any of you have particular questions, uh, at the bottom of this presentation I just did, if you go to the MTA or the, the Purple Line website, our contact information is in there. And these documents are public documents, so if you want to see them, you can see them as they're developed for construction. Great. Um, th this question applies not just to College Park, but to other places along the line. It's an issue I've raised before. When or where will we see the detailed alignment of track and stations in College Park and in other places? We understand that the project has been described as being under design until very recently. Okay, so that's a really good point. When we did the job, we got what were called reference documents. And those reference documents showed where the alignment needed to go. Now, we can tweak it a little bit, but in most places, we don't move it very much. And the reason for that is this went through an environmental impact statement. Some of the locations of some of those tracks were specifically agreed to as part of a public process. We can't move them. Quite frankly, when I got here, I asked a lot of really hard questions about why is the track here as opposed to here. And it was decisions that the community had made well before this job was ever done. Okay. Um, a question for Brad. Um, you mentioned, let's share the wealth here a little. You mentioned uh, $2 billion in development along the route, but there's n there are no cranes in the air in the Tacoma Langley crossroads, yet at least. Do you know of any interest in development between Riggs Road and New Hampshire Avenue? I don't, rec is this on? I don't recall citing a number of investment. Did I? I don't think I did. Yeah, that wasn't me. So I don't, I don't. No comment. I, did, I didn't say that, actually. So I, but, uh, but let me, but having said that, uh, so I got thrown for a, a loop there. Um, so what we've seen so far, so let me, let me answer it this way. I didn't, I didn't, that was not me who said that. But so what we've, what we have seen is an uptick in interest. Um, we have seen property owners, once the, the funding agreement was signed and the deal went hard, right, and, and folks knew that things were going to happen, We've seen an uptick in inquiries. We've seen an uptick in activity. We've seen an uptick in, in property owners um, engaging us in conversation, uh, seeking to understand how their current property was zoned, what the options would be, uh, what the timeline for construction might be. Um, so I think it's one of those things where you can see a noticeable um, noticeable increase in activity along the route and I think it's still going to take some time to play out um, you know the, some of those who are are building their projects now as construction of the perm line is ongoing it's not easy um, it's not easy building it's not easy building next to transit it's even harder building next to transit that's being built um, and we're seeing that in College Park, and the, and and, and uh, Fred's guys are doing a good job with it too, because we all have we all have we all have needs and interests that have got to get taken into account. We just got to be well coordinated, and uh, we're doing a good job in College Park. We're doing a good job on Gilbane. It just takes more work, and that's where I come back to with with that's something that that our office understands, our county understands, is an objective to help facilitate that process. Uh, but we're. Projects that are that are coming out of the ground now, in large measure, were coming out of the ground or had initiated construction before the funding agreement had been signed. Um, but I think we're going to see a continued increase in activity along the route. The Tacoma Langley Crossroads are really an ironic special case. On the one hand, CAS of Maryland's headquarters is quite nearby. On the other hand, it's a region which resists redevelopment. First of all, the jurisdictional separation goes right down the middle. Secondly, uh, there are large property owners who are per perfectly happy with the cash flows they're getting with what they've got, and they're not particularly interested in redevelopment. Is there any focus in Prince George's County planning on the crossroads? Absolutely. Um, and, and this is the area, you know, we know that there's a fear of displacement. You know, I don't think, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I don't think that you're just going to see um, those apartments get bulldozed and, and replaced with 14-story shiny condo buildings. I just, I, I just don't think that that's a, I don't think that's a realistic scenario. I just don't. I think that, that what instead we want to see is, well, first off, during the construction, and this comes back to when we talked earlier about, or I mentioned earlier about impact on existing buildings, I think that is most acute in the Langley Park area. Um, 
We also benefit from the fact that we have a lot of pedestrian foot traffic there too, which tends to have at least, and look, I'm not saying that there's not issues or substantial issues, but at least they can better navigate a site than a vehicular um, intersection, than a vehicular interaction at a construction site. Um, but I think what we want to see is we want to see an investment in that area. We want to see an, an increase in the quality of housing options that are available to the people who live there. We don't want anybody... We do not want any single soul who lives there now to be priced out of living in the Langley Park area. What we do want to see is an increase in the quality of their housing options. Because as mentioned, the folks who own that property, and I'm not going to speak to their intent, but those properties are old. They suffer from a lack of investment in many, many, in many instances. And, and the folks who live there, man, you want to talk about hardworking folks. Uh, there you have it. And they're also the folks who are going to benefit, in my opinion, the most from having the Purple Line site. It's the same reason why, and this was in my, oh gosh, two jobs ago, we went to the mat for the Langley Transit Center. We went to the mat for that. That was a fundamentally important project. You had, oh gosh, back then, 18 different bus stops scattered around the Langley Park area, and they were consolidated all in the one place. And now that place is going to be across the street from our Purple Line stop. That area, I think, in my opinion, and these are, these are folks who talk about the human rights element of transportation options. That's a place that is going to benefit from that investment, arguably more than any other. Fred, your turn. Uh, the visitor says, I just saw a movable sign today on University Boulevard near Riggs Road. It referred to a closure, but I didn't get the, to read the whole sign. What did it say? <laughs> you know every sign on the roof. <laughs> this is where Cardack kicks in. Uh, I wanted to say one thing about Brad. I went through that neighborhood. I toured that neighborhood with Castle. I saw the housing conditions there and the opportunities for people who want to work, extraordinary. And these people really want to have accessibility, and this project will give them mobility. No question about that. The variable message sign, um, I, am, I have to confess, I didn't see that. I was more worried about the variable message sign at Littonsville Bridge, which said the bridge was open. <laughs> so that's been kind of my focal point lately, but I'll go check this one out tomorrow morning when I'm driving, so I, I can't tell you, I'm sorry. And the second part, it says, will cars be able to cross the tracks? I assume that's where the Purple Line crosses the bridge. Sure. Now, some of these, the Purple Line is kind of unusual because some of the track is in the street. Some of it's a dedicated right-of-way that's uh, flush instead of the railroad tracks like you see at CSX. And then um, some of it is street running, so it looks embedded in the track, in the, in the road. Some of it's in a separate right-of-way alongside, and it's embedded in, in a pavement or some smooth surface so people can get across it. Uh, the whole idea here is not to have the Purple Line be a barrier to anyone. And so places where, but we do want to try to control where people cross it because it's so quiet coming up that people with earbuds in their ears or people in automobiles who are not paying attention run the risk uh, until they become really familiar with the changes of getting struck. So we're very careful about making sure that there are clear places where people can cross. Um, these tracks are smaller than a railroad track. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're the width of a set of car tires, but when they're in the pavement, the only real thing that has a problem sometimes is if a bicycle or a motorcycle goes along the alignment of the track and gets caught in it. And so we have, about a year before the project opens up, a very aggressive uh, education program. You know, people here are somewhat familiar, but they think of WMATA. This is not WMATA. This is a light rail vehicle that's got embedded track in the street, and it's a whole different ballgame. You know, people who are in accessibility vehicles like wheelchairs or mobility vehicles or whatever, we need to make sure that they understand that their wheel can get caught in that track and it can overturn or get them stuck. So we have a huge education program at the end of the project about that particular issue. Great. Yes. I just, uh, in, in terms of uh, questions about the um, the status and different construction projects, I, I just looked at my phone because I get text messages pretty regular, pretty consistently about uh, different things that are being closed down. Um, so, so whoever asked the sign about the qu the the question about the sign, the movable sign, make sure you sign up for those uh, those alerts. Uh, um, I, I looked at my phone to see if my if I had gotten a text message about that, but my text messages only cover this part of the of the alignment. Somebody will tell me that. I'll make sure. 
It's lane closures on university. I live in the area. It's lane closures because they're closing the middle lanes because they're ripping up. Oh, the median, right. Okay. The okay. Okay. That's I understand what that is. Though. That's that's so that we can maintain traffic during construction by taking the median out. We're doing the same thing with Kenilworth and a couple other places. Yeah. Okay. I'll find out about that. Though. Make sure that, that notification. Works. Here's a question that's probably interesting to everybody at the table, but Brad, it may be in your department since it's a, sort of a general one. What is being done in Prince George's County to identify missing sidewalks near the stations and to get them built? Good question. Um, that's something that, um, that's important. And I know that most of the roads, every road that the Purple Line traverses is a state road. Initially, when the project was proposed, there were some roads that the, the, the tracks traveled on that were not state roads. They have been deeded over to the state. Uh, Campus Drive, um, Mayor Wohan mentioned the, the part, let me get my bearing straight, the part over there that, sorry, I don't mean to point right in front of you, the part over there that goes underneath the CSX tracks, that had been a county road. Uh, River Road, after it goes under the tracks and it comes up to the College Park Metro site, it takes the right before it goes back to Kenilworth, that had been a county road. They, were, they are now all state roads. Um, and I would have to think that knowing River Road and Campus Drive both had sidewalks, I'd imagine that the places where sidewalks were missing were on existing state roads. But that comes back to plugging those holes is something I came back, something I mentioned about making sure that the overall ecosystem around the Purple Line is the way we want it to be. It comes back to the landscaping, it comes back to the bike lanes, it comes back to the public art, and it comes back to the sidewalks, is making sure that all those elements are there for a complete project. Um, you know, right now we, we, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the regulatory approvals for the Purple Line construction is the state responsibility, but the county has a role. The county has a role in the sense that we get to opine on what they propose, and then have a conversation. We have a lot of good dialogue with the state on this, and something, the pedestrian connectivity element of this, especially when you get to the stations, is something of, of primary importance to us. As well, you know, and, and, and as well as location of, um, you know, right now the county is, is rolling out a bike share program. And these stations are obviously, obviously uh, prime candidates for an expansion of our bike share program as well. One final question related generally to outreach. What is the current effort to reach out to the Spanish-speaking members of the community, especially in the Langley Park area, since there will be two stations there? Let me answer that. Okay. We have a very aggressive outreach program. If you will pardon me about texting while I was listening to Brad talk, I will find out the answer to your question on Langley because we're very connected in this group. And Carla will probably answer me by the time we leave. Um, we have a very, um, we have, our workforce is probably about 40% Hispanic. Um, in the community area, one of the places that I was taken first was the uh, CASA facility, CASA facility um, in Langley Park, and I toured the housing, I toured the community, I went to the training center. Um, you know, it was kind of interesting to walk into a place where um, I obviously am kind of a different looking individual. Um, I lost my hair a long time ago. and. Uh, there are people who look and are really wanting to work. And I was really struck by that, and I thought, you know what, I may not be here, but that project's gonna be here, and it's gonna be taking people to jobs. And these are people who are working to get skills. So, I, and with Brad, what Brad said, the other thing that happens with these projects is um, you build them the best you can for what you know at the time, and then what you find out is rideshare comes along. People start biking. Lyft, Uber, uh, you know, car to go comes up. Uh, all kinds of things begin to happen. And, you know, we're designing something that's got a, a 70 year life and we're going to operate it for 30. I wish I had a crystal ball to know everything, but in the time we're designing this project and building it, the technology is going to change. And so, what we're trying to think about now is well, what do we do about that last mile, first mile connection? Is it the buses that Brad talked about extending that connection? Is it uh, providing a place where people can ride up and drop off at Littonsville, for example. There's a kiss and ride lot. There's no big parking garage, it's a kiss and ride. People can be dropped off, get a station to be able to go wherever they want to go. So, but the outreach part of this project is very, very important, both in the workplace, the business opportunities. Alfred spends a tremendous amount of time on just the outreach part of that. Um, and within our, our HR employment uh, communication of people, we're bilingual, at least bilingual. 
when I went to the CASA facility, there was somebody from every continent except the two polar continents. So we have to, be, and I mean that really, we have to be very sensitive to that, especially in this community now, because this is a transportation system for everyone. We want to make sure that people are able to use it, not barriers to language or familiarity or whatever. Very important. What a great note to end on. Will you all please join me in thanking the members of the panel for being here? This train runs on time. Thank you very much for coming. We look forward to seeing you at our next forum. Look for the announcement.